Mesdames et Messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Merci beaucoup pour votre... Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to the 11th Annual Public Meeting of Canada's International Development Research Centre of... And merci. 11th Annual Public Meeting for IDRC. My name is Margaret Biggs, je m'appelle Margaret Biggs et je suis présidente du Conseil de gouverneur du Centre et j'ai le plaisir de déclarer la séance uh, ouverte. And uh, my name is Margaret Biggs, I'm a chairperson of RDSC's Board of Governors. It's, this meeting will be conducted in both official languages. A, we, we have uh, interpreters, uh, headsets at the back of the room. Des écouteurs, oui, ici, pour une... We have uh, headsets at the back of the room and... Uh, uh, the meeting as well. So just a few little housekeeping messages for you. So we have, uh, we have an engaging program for our annual general meeting today for you. Um, we're gonna, you're going to learn a little bit more about what, the, what IDRC has done over this past year and also some insights into where IDRC is going because it's in the process of centres in the process of developing a very new and innovative strategic plan to guide the centres work toward 2030. Um, so IDRC's contribution, everything it's done in the past and will do in the future is really based upon the strength and the brilliance really of, of the staff of IDRC in the room, many of you here in the room, in the building in Ottawa and in our, in our in around the world. So thank you all first and foremost to IDRC's uh, staff um, everywhere for everything that they've done. They're really the basis of IDRC's success now and into the future rests very much with them and of course with the leadership which is here in the room as well. We also have many of the, of the center's governors. The Board of Governors is meeting right now. We have many of our governors here with us. And it's a, I made them, they're all been made to sit in the front row, which they're not very happy about. Um, but it's a real pleasure to work with uh, all of you, with um, people from Canadians and international uh, uh, governors who bring tremendous uh, expertise, dedication, and passion to the work of IDRC and Canada's efforts in this domain. So thank you all very much for being here. And uh, some of our governors were reappointed this year by, by the Government of Canada, and uh, we're very pleased to hear that, that they had their mandates renewed. I'm going to introduce those first, if I may. Um, Marianne Chambers, John MacArthur, Chandra Madramuto, and Barbara Trenholm. These governors have served, and they they they, they for their they they've signed on for another three to four years, or two to three four years. So thank you very much, uh, Sophie Dumont aussi uh, uh, également. Et also, Sophie Dumont was also reappointed for second mandate. Then we have some other governors who uh, whose mandates uh, date back uh, at least a year or so, and I'd like to recognize them if you don't mind standing as I introduce you. Um, à quoi si à quoi si adieu. In Purnima Manet, Jo Rivard, Stephen Toop, and of course, Monsieur Lebel, Jean Lebel, the CEO. We have two other governors who aren't able to be with us today, uh, Alex Witte from uh, Kenya and Shainur Koja, who, who was here but had, uh, isn't able to be here right this moment. I would like to recognize the contribution of Dominic Crotty. Uh, always brought. Um, a special quality to our deliberations from her work in Uganda and uh, brought a sort of a human touch and uh, constantly bringing us back to our core core values and purpose purpose at the center. So thank you to Dominique who actually sent us a message a couple days ago to wish us well in our meeting today. So the theme of this year's, uh, the most recent annual report for IDRC is partnering for global impact. I know you've all read it, but if you haven't, it's on the website. <laughs> IDRC.ca to, to take a look at that. And partnerships are, are very fundamental to how IDRC works. Um, uh, IDRC can in, can't, can't extend its reach, can't have influence and impact at scale if it doesn't work with partners. And by connecting and collaborating with others, uh, the center is able to grow not just the pool of resources, but expertise, networks, uh, and make those available to the researchers that we're working with in the developing countries. 
And of course, partnerships are critical to achieving the sustainable development goals. We're not going to get there. Uh, people just work individually in their own efforts. It's going to take a combination of people working in common effort. Um, and that's something that IDRC has done and will continue to do. So this collaborative approach and figuring out how to work with people and, and, and consulting with people was very much uh, part of the consultations that took place over the last, over the summer to get ready for the thinking and the planning around the strategic plan. And uh, four consultations were held in, in, in parts of the developing world where IDRC has, has its operations and a lot of its research. One was in Mexico City, and that focused on digital innovation. I think, Jean, you were there for, you were there for all of them, I think. Yeah, digital innovation, that is, you know, was a tremendously interesting uh, piece. In Amman, Jordan, there was a discussion around research for development in fragile contexts. Again, another particularly important area that IDRC is uh, uh, moving into. And then there were consultations in Vietnam, Nepal, and India that, again, Jean was part of, but as were some governors as well. And in there, we, we focused on uh, getting input around climate, health, gender, and education. And then there was another consultation in Dakar. I think Maggie was there, maybe Jean was there, and that focused on gender and inclusion. So there have been consultations in Canada, but uh, including, but there have also been consultations in, with, uh, in our partner countries. And these discussions are now in the mill, um, to help to identify what the priorities should be for the center, but particularly what the regional priorities would be, where the knowledge gaps are, who are the partners that we could work with, et cetera. So all of that is in the mix right now. So these consultations will be informing the work of the center as it develops its forward plan and, in particular, its program concentration. Um, in our new strategy that that's, people are working on right now, there's going to be an, an increased impact uh, uh, emphasis as well on partnerships with Canadians. Um, our work is focused on developing country researchers and needs and the needs of the communities and the populations in those countries, but we have a number of partners. In Canada, Jean's been leading this work where we can actually leverage more of Canada's expertise and know-how and partner that up with, uh, with our developing country uh, contacts. So it's now my pleasure actually to, to introduce our president and CEO, Jean Lebel, um, who's uh, going to speak to the accomplishments of IDRC over the past year and to the priorities that lie ahead. And, and then we're going to have a, a special, a special, our special uh, person today is going to be Catherine Toure, who's our regional director in East and South Africa. And she's going to talk to us about building leaders. But first, Jean, over to you to talk about IDRC's uh, past and present and future. Bonsoir, uh, good evening. Good evening. Margaret, thank you very much, Margaret. And uh, good evening also to the people that will look at the uh, broadcast later on our website. Thank you for coming late afternoon on a Tuesday to hear about how this organization is making a world of difference. But to begin, I would like to recognize IDRC Board of Governor. Uh, you have already been introduced, but I think Margaret has been extremely humble in not mentioning that she has been also renewed as our chair. And she is assuming this leadership with passion, with guidance, and with a great collegial sense. So Margaret, thank you very much on my behalf and behalf of the management team for guiding us. Uh, through the journey. And let me thank also the governors uh, present here, mais aussi les employés. Qui... Also the employee that on a daily basis determine the impact of RDSC. They all contribute to our vision within the scope of their knowledge and looking for solution for a more sustainable world and around our board Tem and uh, throughout our organization, we have all the requirements to enter in our new strategic plan, which is at the heart of our discussion at the board this week. So Insight from the year behind us and to speak to the road ahead. This year, we assess our performance against the 2015-2020 20 strategic plan and pursue the development of a new strategic plan for 2020 to 2030. Under the current plan, we set out to do a number of things differently in the early days. Through our visions of knowledge, innovation, and solution for a better world, 
we particularly focus our attention of trying to develop larger projects. We use new modality like consortium approach that leverages the powers of partnership. And we enhance our own internal use of data and evidence. And everyone in the field knows that data and analytics is a lingo in every organization. But at IDRC, we have been an early taker of this approach back in the old days, but bringing it with a fresh perspective today. Comment avons-nous fait? How did we do that? We have put within our organization new system, we have new policy, we have underscored or uh, enlightened leadership in subjects such as climate change and underscoring diversity, among others. And we have added our support to students here and uh, in other countries, uh, and also support to uh, researchers uh, uh, in Canada or in the developing world. One thing that is not often said is uh, RDRC's uh, contribution to the knowledge generation. And I would like here to draw your attention to something that uh, might uh, look uh, uh, different, but we have a new research that is called Research Quality Plus with tools that are used here to assess our knowledge, but also use in other institutions throughout the world to ensure that our work makes a difference. And this kind of work that is not often mentioned is uh, also um, showcase uh, in uh, publications such as Nature um, Bulletin that uh, underscored that. Look, 2020 strategic plan was driven by three strategic objectives. First, invest in knowledge and innovation for large-scale positive change. Second, build the leaders for today's and tomorrow. And third, be the partner of choice for greater impact. I would like to share a few brief examples of the result we achieve under each of these objectives. First, large-scale positive change. One example of this is the Canadian International Food Security Research Fund, better known under the name internally of CIFSURF. <laughs> this is a partnership between IDRC and Global Affairs Canada, created for supporting research and innovation and to promote long-term change in agriculture, nutrition, women's economic empowerment, and global food system research. This program that lasts for 10 years and came to conclusion last year, supported 39 projects in 24 countries and implemented by 40 Southern and 20 Canadian team. Innovation supported through this partnership led to a reach of 78 million people. That means millions of people consuming better, healthier food. It means, it means more than a million farmers benefiting from improved income and productivity, reducing drudgery, and strengthening their capacity. This is a large impact in IDRC lingo, but it's not enough, and we are aiming towards reaching higher scale with our new strategic plan. The deuxième objectif était de former des chefs de file. Uh, next, we wanted to have leaders within the research area and that we have the support that we offered to the uh, Institute of African and Science in Mathematics uh, with the aims. Uh, these are training, rigorous training in mathematics and fundamental sciences to African students, postgraduate students, uh, to ensure that they are African experts throughout the world and that they offer the expertise everywhere in the world. They receive scholarship and uh, in and during their stay at the institute, they try to reserve complex issues. We support with the government of Canada other funding partners, uh, the AIMS initiative. And this year, we have launched some uh, document celebrating African researcher. And I would start the feminine, feminine uh, side of it, African. Celebrating African women scientists on the front line of a topic of real interest to the world, climate change. 
Elle dresse le profil de nouvelle chef de And they give the profile of new leaders in climate change. Those represent uh, brilliant uh, uh, that work against negative impact of climate change on their countries and on the continent. This enables us to accomplish two things. First of all, we carry out a promotion. First of all, I should say, there is a promotion and knowledge of uh, women's contribution in the science of uh, climate change. Also, we hope that this will encourage these young women to pursue their careers in science, technology, in engineering, and in mathematics to have a new generation of leaders that would uh, resolve uh, local uh, issues with uh, global knowledge. Something that is close to my heart as the CEO partnership. One of example of our partnership is with the United Kingdom Department for International Development, DFID. We have been partnering with DFID since 19, no, not 19, 2006 on climate change research. And last year we completed the work of the collaborative adaptation research initiative in Africa and Asia that everyone knows at IDRC under the name of CARIA. This initiative supported of collaborative research on climate change adaptation to inform policy and practice. For example, last year, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, released a special report on the impact of the global climate warning, warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius. When this report was commissioned, there was little research on this especially at the regional level, where we are very present. CARIA supported scientists recognize this, CARIA supported scientists recognize this gap and collaborated to investigate how warming by 1.5 degree and two degrees would impact specific region, specific hotspots, as we are seeing in our own lingo. Their finding found that, for instance, at least one quarter of the ice on the Himalayan mountain will be lost, affecting 13% of the world's population. And this was acknowledged and published in numbers of high-level publication, but it was also attached to a set of activities that establish what is the best policy framework to use in order to resolve some dying problem. Resource limitation, particularly water, as well as and managing landslide in those regions. More research in, is needed in that field, and it will continue under the new strategic plan. We just recently signed a two-year partnership with our friend in the UK in order to pursue the work with a program that will look at the resilience and the sustainability. So these are three examples that I brought to your attention of work that we have accomplished in the last year, but that has impact throughout the strategy period of 2015-2020. And we hope that this will shape also our approach towards 2030. To move on a 10-year horizon, reflect on our focus on long-term sustainable change and the fact that research is not accomplished in a matter of days, but sometime in a matter of years, if not of generations. But the beauty of research is that along the process, we find innovation that can be helpful at a point in time and leads to improvement of condition, if not the resolution of the entire problem. This new strategic plan will be an existing area of strength and take us in new direction as well. This strategy that we're talking about now at uh, our governor's meeting will enable IDRC to support our programs until 2030, thanks to the vision of knowledge, uh, thanks to the innovation and solutions aiming for a more inclusive and sustainable world. And that will make of RGC the leader in research development in Canada and a world leader. On we will launch IDRC new strategic plan. Stay tuned. May will mark also a very particular anniversary. It will be our 50th anniversary celebration beginning. What a perfect opportunity to celebrate an innovation plan for the future built for the future built on decades of experience. 
We look forward to sharing the new strategy with you. Stay tuned to our website, email, newsletter, and social media channel. Margaret, I'm going to pass the podium back to you. But before doing so, I want to thank and acknowledge the presence of all my colleagues at IDRC that are in the room tonight for their leadership and support in this journey of transformation of our organization where we are pursuing the mandate that was given to us by government 15 years ago, 50 years ago. Make the world better through research with example that I hope you found interesting and many more to come in the future. Margaret, back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Jean. Um, so an exciting year ahead, the uh, 50th anniversary of the Act of Parliament to create the International Development Research Center. Um, right now I'm going to introduce Catherine, Catherine Touré. So I said Catherine uh, is, is IDRC's uh, regional uh, director is, um, in, in Nairobi, Kenya for, for all of East and Southern Africa. She also previously served as IDRC's regional director in the former West and Central Africa office. Um, she holds a PhD. Uh, in education from the, the Université de Montréal, uh, where she focused on the appropriation of information and communication technologies by African educators. Um, her research has focused largely on Africa in the areas of cultural diversity, conflict management, women in STEM, education and globalization. That's, that's a lot. Um, and she herself has been a leader in innovation in the education sector and has coordinated regional education network in West and Central Africa. So she's, she's got a ton of experience and she's going to speak to us now about building leaders. And she herself is a leader. She's specifically gonna speak about women's leadership in science for sustainable agriculture in Africa. So, Catherine. Merci beaucoup, Margaret. Thank you very much, Margaret. Good afternoon. Welcome to the IDRC. We will travel now to Africa. I would like to introduce certain organizations with which IDRC work that aims at promoting uh, women in science and in agriculture. So they may realize their full potential as scientists. And science needs the intellect, diverse perspectives, and creativity of women to transform the boundaries of knowledge and the very practice of agriculture. To better integrate women into science fields, we must challenge stereotypical gender roles address implicit bias in decision-making that may negatively impact the recruitment and promotion of women, and evolve science professions and workplaces to make them more attractive and accommodating to women. Before we meet some remarkable women doing groundbreaking research in Africa, let us consider why we should be interested in agriculture. Agriculture is an important part of the national economy in Canada, like it is in most African countries, and of course, is essential to food security. Communities of farmers in Canada and communities of farmers in various African countries face similar challenges, like adapting to climate change, accessing credit, and involving youth in the future of agricultural development. Women carry a disproportionate amount of the labor and production burden in African agriculture, while at the same time facing major barriers to achieving meaningful leadership roles. Actions and policies in Canada directly impact the global food production system. We can passively support inequality or take positive action to improve lives and livelihoods. In Sub-Saharan Africa, gender inequality costs an estimated 125 billion Canadian dollars annually. If women were given the same access as men to productive resources such as fertilizers, machinery, and information, 
they can increase yields on their farms by 20 to 30 percent. Access to inputs and technologies is important. It is equally important to address social and cultural norms that prevent women from owning land and from making decisions about how household incomes are invested. Similarly, women must be involved in food security and agricultural research if society is to benefit from their nuanced understanding and lived experience of food production systems. When women are left out, their concerns are left out. Investments might be biased, for example, toward machines that help in the processing of crops grown by men while neglecting to understand improvements women would like to see. Worldwide, Canada is a leader in promoting inclusive approaches when it comes to development, including in agriculture. For example, through the Feminist International Assistance Policy, which is the envy of some African nations, and I can tell you stories about that later. The Feminist International Assistance Policy recognizes that supporting gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is the best way to build a more peaceful, inclusive, and prosperous world. Such an aspiration is not dissimilar from ones shared in the African Union's Agenda 2063 titled The Africa We Want which seeks through one of its goals to strengthen the role of women in all spheres of life. I promise you that we would meet some women doing innovative and transformative research across Africa, but before that, let us just consider a few more statistics. Two thirds of African women are engaged in agriculture and they produce 90% of the continent's food. However, only one in four agricultural scientists in Africa is a woman. So we need more women in agricultural sciences. How do we foster the next generation of women science leaders? Our experience at IDRC has shown the importance of supporting mentorship and leadership training for women, helping them develop and grow their networks, and providing support for their research. With support for research, early career women can create research labs, come up with useful innovations, be recognized, and thereby enhance their bargaining power in their organization. It's important to have women with masters and PhDs, and equally important to support women once they obtain a position in a research organization. Otherwise, they may be discouraged and abandon science careers after so much toil and many years of preparation. What is IDRC doing to foster women's leadership in agricultural, in African agriculture? Now is when I would like to introduce you to some amazing young women benefiting from IDRC support and some accomplished women who benefited from support in the past. To provide mentorship, leadership training, and support for networking, IDRC works with an organization called African Women in Agricultural Research and Development, or AWARD. Alongside the Gates Foundation and La Fondation Paribas, IDRC contributes to the just launched One Planet Fellowships for Gender Responsive Agricultural Research. Two of the 45 laureates for this year are featured on this slide. They benefit from novel career development opportunities. For example, Madame Aqua Tamia Kwaku from Cote d'Ivoire is studying how to improve biodiversity in the southern part of her country where the growth of cashew plantations has negatively impacted farmers. Madame Alimata Bandaogo, who studied at Kwame Nkrumah University in Ghana, is helping smallholder farmers in Burkina Faso adapt to climate change through her research on improved crop varieties and appropriate fertilization techniques. Jean Lebel spoke about the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, known as AIMS, which is a pan-African network with centers of excellence in six African countries 
And Ames organizes every two years the largest science gathering in Africa, which is called the Next Einstein Forum. So we will be there in March 2020 in Nairobi, and maybe we'll see some of you there. Beyond African governments, the first donors of Ames were the Government of Canada and IDRC. Those partnerships catalyzed support for Ames from over a half dozen other donors, including the Bosch Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, the MasterCard Foundation, and UKAID. Almost 2,000 young people have graduated from Ames with degrees in applied mathematics, and 32% of the graduates are women. Ames graduates have gone on to teach at universities and to work in industry. Pictured here are some women who have received grants or fellowships from Ames to help advance their research on adaptation and resiliency in the face of climate change. Dr. Adana Henry Ukoha from Nigeria will help cassava farmers in her country adapt to climate change by developing mathematical models to examine the costs and benefits of various adaptation strategies. It is anticipated that her work will improve food security and rural livelihoods. IDRC supports early career women scientists through a UNESCO organization called the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. Such support helps women who are already in a science profession to advance their research and their careers. Pictured here, we see three women a researcher from Malawi who is reducing crop loss through biological pest control, a researcher from Rwanda who is improving knowledge among smallholder chicken farmers, and a researcher from Ethiopia who is predicting the quality of green coffee beans using infrared scanning technologies. Look for great things to come from these women and other members of their cohort, cohort in years to come. So I've talked about some young women and organizations in which IDRC is investing today. I would like now to introduce you to four women IDRC supported in the past and speak to some of their accomplishments. Here we have a picture of Dr. Clementine Dabiré, who worked at the National Agricultural Research Institute in Burkina Faso and received several IDRC grants. Maybe some of you have heard, especially Chandra, have heard of the Purdue Improved Cow Pea Storage Bag, or PICS Bag, P-I-C-S. Cow peas are a major staple and cash crop in West and Central Africa, which are planted and harvested primarily by women. A PICS bag is a specially designed three-layered bag that protects cow peas from insect infestation and thus extends the shelf life. Dr. Dabiré organized PICS bag storage competitions among women, which boosted the use of the bags from 10% to 97% in just two years. Her research, her community engagement, and leadership resulted in reduced crop losses and increased revenues among women farmers. Dr. Dabiré went on to head in Burkina Faso the National Forum for Scientific Research and Technological Innovations. This forum showcases scalable innovations to investors and has become an inspiration for other West African countries. Here we have Dr. Agnes Kalibata, whom many of you might know. She received a partial support from IDRC to complete her PhD. In Rwanda, she became permanent secretary and later minister of agriculture in the government. As agriculture minister, she was one of two winners of the 2012 Yara Food Prize, now the Africa Food Prize. She is now president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, or AGRA, a highly visible and influential forum for inclusive and sustainable agricultural development. I would also like you to meet Honorable Professor Joyce Ndalichako, who is Minister of Education, Science, and Technology in Tanzania. I was at a dinner last week in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania with Nasser 
and other colleagues, and 200 other people from across Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. When Minister Ndali Chako spoke to open the annual forum of the African Science Graining Council Initiative, she paused to recognize IDRC, which supported her to complete her PhD at the University of Alberta. All of us present from IDRC were very proud, and moments like that make Canada look very good abroad. They show the types of in-depth relationships that IDRC, as a Canadian Crown Corporation, nourishes over time. I would like to introduce you to one more woman scientist, Professor Carl Henry, a Canadian professor of food and nutrition. She was part of the project teams funded by the Canadian International Food Security Research Fund, CIFSURF, like uh, Jean Lebel said, launched by IDRC with funding from Global Affairs Canada. Through this work, she collaborated with colleagues at Hawassa University in Ethiopia. This gave her international exposure and recognition in Canada, where she organized international conferences at the University of Saskatchewan. So what have we learned through these various initiatives over the years? We have learned that investing in women agricultural scientists, open spaces for women in male-dominated fields, makes agricultural resource sciences more accommodating to women, and supports women to shape science fields and even the way agriculture is organized. We have also learned that we need to build leaders today for tomorrow and that supporting women agricultural leaders is a way to invest in large-scale positive change. We also know the importance of partnering synergistically and in complementary ways for, with various organizations in Canada and beyond, including other donors, for maximum learning and impact. Finally, we know that in responding to one sustainable development goal like zero hunger, for example, we need to simultaneously respond to others in an integrated way. So in wrapping up, I would like to recognize that in the room we do have some IDRC program directors, leaders, and officers, and evaluation staff who've been involved with initiatives that I've mentioned. So in case we need help answering questions, I would just like you to <laughs> identify yourselves right away by raising your uh, hand so we can recognize you. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your engaging questions. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, well, you told us uh, how vital um, agriculture is in African economies and how vital women are to agricultural production and to agricultural nutrition in, in Africa. You outlined why it's so important to help women participate and succeed in science ventures. Um, you gave us some really inspiring examples, some of which you know some of us will have heard of, but and also some innovative solutions that they're working on that, upon which we can build. Um, but I, what I found most exciting is that there's a generation out there, a generation of aspiring early career uh, women scientists who are already doing amazing things, but who will continue to do even more amazing things. And the IDRC has helped to, to build that generation of leadership. And uh, what did you say, build leaders today for tomorrow. So a tremendous e example. Um, and we will not achieve the sustainable development goals if we do not unleash the power and the potential of those of those leaders. So thank you very much uh, for that example. Um, so that's an example of the kind of work that IDRC has done over the last five years and the last year, um, more to come. And uh, now it's going to be an opportunity to open it up for you uh, to ask any questions of about the, some of the examples of what, what Catherine's brought to you or about the, the organization, and Jean and I can handle that. Um, so I remind you that there are um, interpretation devices at the back, and nous serons heureux de... Nous serons heureux and we'll be more than happy to answer uh, any questions you would like to ask. Uh, for you to to uh, come to the mics and ask us some really difficult questions, all of whom which will go to Jean Lebel um, and uh, and Catherine. Thank you. 
go for it. Or if you don't ask questions, Jean will start asking you questions, so. No? Don't be shy. Yes, please go to the microphone. I thank you for uh, this uh, excellent presentation. Um, I'm new to IDRC, and I would like to know more about uh, the work of I I IDRC uh, related to development and conflict resolution. I mean, development in conflict areas. Thank you. That one's going to Monsieur Lebel. Yes. <laughs> You want the short or the long answer? <laughs> we have a long tradition of working in what we would consider, you know, fragile context, which is, you know, a concept that looks at country that are rebuilding after conflict, that looks at places where institutions are weak, where there is mistrust, uh, where there's been a moment of tension or a moment of uh, breaking up of society and how we rebuild on solid ground with the right type of information that guides the future. I'll give you two examples. One historic. Uh, at the time of the transition to an anti-apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, IDRC was closely associated with the government of Canada in providing support to the leadership of South Africa that was in the making and looking forward to the transition. Nelson Mandela himself called Canada, that translated into CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency at the time, the Global Affairs Canada and IDRC to play together. We provide resources, but also conduit to people around the world that went through similar transition. For what purpose? Build a better South African society. The election took place in 1994, and over half of the cabinet was constituted by a researcher that at a point in time had received funding from Canada through IDRC. That's an illustration of the work that we are doing. Now, moving to these days, take a region like West Africa, like, you know, Catherine knows very well, as well as our regional director for West Africa, Julie Crowley, that is just sitting at the back there, our most recent recruit in our regional team, as uh, we are opening officially on December 2nd our office in, in the, our regional office in Dakar. West Africa is going through tremendous change, population-wise, capacity-wise, but also at the face of moving target that relates to you know, extremism and security that is changing. There's need to support these democracy in Burkina Faso, in Côte d'Ivoire, in Senegal, in Gambia, that have proven over time to be extremely resilient. But how do you break up the mold, you know, of this extremism that arise without, you know, getting into a conflict? So that's a very big challenge. And research can help, whether it's true, you know, the work that Catherine was describing on agriculture, to create more resilience and sustainable society where all are participating. And with that, oh, we are able to have, you know, some stability and avoid conflict or preserve, you know, the integrity of those uh, democracy. Catherine? Yes, please. So I'd <laughs> like to give an example of uh, the kind of work that Jean was mentioning, some of the, the methodologies that we use at IDRC in conflict resolution situations by talking briefly about some of the work that we fund through our governance and justice program. Um, you know that the majority of the population in Africa are uh, young people, so we have what we call a youth cohort. So we have several research projects in several different countries across the continent that are led by young people, backed up by more senior researchers. So the young people are taking the lead uh, to uh, grapple with the questions for their futures. And so they're multidisciplinary teams. So for example, in Zimbabwe, we work with the youth uh, empowerment transformation trust called YET. 
And so the researchers and civil society uh, work together to figure out, well, what is the youth agenda? What is it that the youth want for the, for the future? And how can we help define that agenda and thereby avoid conflict by then facilitating conversations between uh, the youth and elected officials? Um, so for example, because I want to talk about the methodologies that we use, which are participatory, it's not academic research from the university, it's on the ground. So the YET, the people in uh, YET will uh, work in the communities when parliamentarians travel from the capital city to go to visit their constituencies, they'll make sure to organize breakfast meetings between the young people and the elected officials. The young people would say, oh, so these elected officials are people that we can actually sit down and talk with. And the elected officials are also thankful that they can get a better grip on the youth agenda. So this, uh, this approach of working with uh, youth cohorts across the continent. And they're also learning from, uh, from each other. They're working in a national context, but then learning from each other in a pan-African way as well. Great example. Thank you very much. Is that good? Talk to them afterwards. There's more. Yeah. Other questions or comments or things you'd like to know about the past or where IDRC is going? No? Yes, please. Yeah, a little more on the international side. You mentioned cooperation with some of the, you know, the Gates Foundation and other scientifically oriented uh, development uh, Foundations. I guess the Carter Center would be one another example in the medical field. I'm just wondering about collaboration with some of the uh, humanitarian and human rights organizations that come to mind, like Amnesty or Human Rights Watch, or you know, Doctors Without Borders, Lawyers Without Borders, Academics Without Borders. Uh, do you have you know joint programs of interest? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, partnership is at the heart of our business model. Uh, there's one dimension of partnership that I briefly mentioned, you know, for example, with the British uh, through the UK aid, the Department for International Development. And we have, you know, about eight of those, you know, large uh, foundation, private foundation or bilateral organization that we are constantly maintaining a long lasting relationship. There is also an aspect of the partnership is about the substance. And that's where, you know, organization like MSF or, you know, uh, Vet Without Border or Academic Without Border come into our eyesight. Uh, I'll give you an example. When uh, the Ebola crisis happened in West Africa, uh, the UK uh, took responsibility with its funding and numbers of other of uh, Sierra Leone. The US took Liberia. And Guinea was left with essentially very limited resources because you know there the situation was the most dramatic with a complete breakdown of the health system. And it was the hard work of Dominique Charon, our vice president program, that has been acknowledged by Canadian government with a prize for public services for this work with a team that put together you know, the thinking with the World Health Organization, Médecins Sans Frontières, Norway, and many other players on how Guinea was going to face the challenge, not by telling them, you should be doing this, but bringing, you know, the Guinean to take responsibility on the ring vaccination of the Canadian vaccine that stopped the spread of Ebola at the time. IDRC was not the reason behind the success. IDRC was one of the element behind the success. And often, you know, in this world, attribution is more important than the action itself. We're very humble. Uh, we provided the right incentive at the right moment. The Guinean did all the work, sometime in partnership with Malian that we had sponsored before, but MSF, WHO, Norway, play critical role. And this is where partnership is the most important. It's about the resources that we are, you know, facing sometimes difficulty in getting, how we work better together. 
but not only on how we are pooling our financial, but how do we secure that the intellectual underpinning is shared and every organization brings the best. And in humanitarian situation, in situation of conflict resolution, this is something that we need to do more. And usually, as uh, Margaret Biggs said, we fund uh, organizations uh, in LMICs, lower and middle income countries, but we also work sometimes with Canadian partners, and so we've partnered with the CG Center, for example, to uh, do worldwide uh, consult, uh, consultation to come up with the World Refugee Report to say, you know, what is the state of state of our world? Where do we have in place the structures that we need to be responsive to uh, to greater flows of people across borders? So that's another example of uh, working with a Canadian organization to have an impact at the at the global scale. And certainly in our next strategic plan, we'll be looking more at issues of forced migration. Great example. Other questions? Those are those are good ones. Anybody else? Yes, please. Let's see. So thank you for speaking very um, eloquently on a lot of important issues. Uh, what I, based on my personal demographic, what I'm very interested in is a lot of work you do with the youth, um, especially you guys already mentioned a lot to do with the developing the leaders of tomorrow. What I'm very interested in specifically is how is putting uh, some of the younger people across the world on the same table with their political counterparts uh, benefit um, international relationships um, you know, in the long term and how has some examples already arisen in the past five to ten years of, of your great work? You start, Catherine, on this one. Absolutely, because I'm just back from the International Conference on Population uh, Development. And as you know, the first uh, ICPD conference, who, who was present there in 1994 in Cairo? Anybody in the room? <laughs> Um, so we're, get, we're getting older, <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> Montasser was there. <laughs> um, so the first ICPD conference put rights at the center of the development agenda. And then 25 years later, UNFPA, along with the government of Denmark and Kenya, organized an ICPD conference in Nairobi where uh, IDRC was present and, uh, and engaging. And part of that was about passing the torch to the next generation on, the, um, on, on, on development issues. So we witnessed a lot of uh, youth engagement. And I would say that, um, let me just give an example. We work with African APHRC, African Population and Health Research Council, which is a major pan-African organization working on health issues in Africa. They were amongst the first to do research in uh, urban settlements and in informal settlements, for example. And they hire a lot of young people to go out into the field and to interview people. So. If you've gone throughout Kenya and you've been to all of the counties, um, you know what's going on at the, at the ground level. And so therefore, you become a good spokesperson for what's going on and what the way forward is. So I've witnessed uh, all youth panels where uh, it's the youth who are telling us that this is in the county budget, this is not in the county budget, and this is what we need to do to reduce maternal and child health, or this is what we need to do to uh, uh, get rid of female genital uh, mutilation in a particular context. So we need more space for youth to be taking the lead and speaking out on, on issues and the way forward. And maybe uh, older generation backing up and backstopping, and, and we do do that at IDRC. For example, through our part, through funding the African Population and Health Research Council. I hope that began to answer your question, but we can have a lot more examples. Uh, you know, speaking by example, in those settings are, are the best way forward, but never forget that there's the idrc.ca website that you should consult. For what reason? I think uh, it's uh, not enough known in Canada that we are providing also grant to young students that are doing their PhD. And often, it's the best way to get in contact with other actors. I was you know, a recipient of support of IDRC because I had 
a professor that was a recipient of support. So I got you know to do my PhD work in the Amazon and get myself acquainted with a community of researcher and that makes a world of difference. Second dimension of this, there we are providing on a yearly basis about a dozen of research awardees. It's highly competitive, but it puts you in contact with an international organization based in Canada with Canadian roots with a world of leader in a field that might be associated to work that you are carrying if you have recently graduated and you're interested to get your feet wet. And the last is something that Catherine was mentioning, but is quite telling about the IDRC way of working. Uh, last fall, I was on a state visit with Her Excellency, our Governor General, Julie Payette, in West Africa, and we stopped in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. And in Côte d'Ivoire, we went to uh, Yamasukro and uh, to Bouake, which is a bit of a distance from the capital. Well, the capital is Yamasukro, from uh, Abidjan. And we're having a meeting with the Minister of uh, Science, Technology, Research. And uh, it's, you know, a small group of about 40, and there's someone of about 40-something, I would say, that comes to me and says, Dr. LaBelle, I'm so happy to meet you. I said, well, pleasure meeting you. You know, I'm now a tenure professor at l'Institut Polytechnique uh, de, de Bouaki. I said, oh, that's fantastic. This was all made possible because I was a master's student of an IDRC granted project. I said, well, fantastic. What was the project? Well, it was the project that you were responsible for as a program <laughs> officer. <laughs> 20 years ago, this young master's student did his research, then you know, moved on to a PhD supported by France, and now is a tenure professor. I pulled aside our Governor General. And I told her, Governor General, this is an illustration of how you make work with research a long-term journey. The relationship that was built in the field at the time of his master last. These people are the best ambassador for research and for this scientific diplomacy, which after all is the common language of everyone. You know, observe establish hypothesis, look at the nature of the problem, investigate it, find answer, and use your knowledge and your capacity to translate this in a better future for your people around you, for your region, for your country. You know, it's simple. It has been running the institution for 50 years, and you can talk to any one of my colleagues and to our governor, they will tell you with passion numbers of story. Youth is fundamental. It's what kicks me on a daily basis. And I can tell you at IDRC, there's many people that are now much younger than I am and that are pushing me. So thank you very much. It was an excellent question. That's a great example. Thank you, Sean. Um, any other questions from, from the floor? Yes, please. So you started off the discussion today about how IDRC is thinking about you know moving, innovating and thinking into 2030. So my question for you is, the work that you're currently doing in international development research um, across the world, how do you see that um, supporting Canada and our progress and developing as a nation as well? You know, my chair is saying I have to answer it, so I'll answer it. I think it's, it's a question that we can answer in multiple facets in multiple ways and in multiple matter. I think the first thing that I think, it gives a window of visibility to Canada about the fact that we are carrying value of this country, that our value you know, of openness, of you know, diversity, of excellence in science. This is reflected in the type of work that we're supporting, but it's also reflected in the values of many other countries. So that built a relationship between the country and the research. Second dimension that I would say is that the model of IDRC is not a model where we say do this, do that. It's a model like our chair was mentioning where we are collecting numbers of insight and information from the people that we're working with in the region that are telling us this is something that we need. Or that are also telling us, you know, don't waste your time on this. We have no interest. There's no ground for that. 
So, you know, there's a dialogue that is established in order, you know, to build the relationship. The third dimension is often, and even more so in the last 10 years, research is a global behavior. It's not Canadian, it's not African, it's not Asian, you know, it's all together. And a big transformation of the IDRC model over the last 10 years has been more and more of those collaboration where Canadian comes, bring their network, Southern, you know, receive welcome. There's this global journey of where the best research at the front of complex problem cannot be branded by a single nation. And that's where, you know, together we bring those networks, we bring the connectivity in a real pragmatic approach through a research project, through a research program like the one that Catherine has illustrated. And I'm going to repeat myself, go to our website. Uh, it's, I think it's a good website. It can always improve. But there's tons of story, there are video, there are literature, it's an accessible format. So those three elements, carrying, you know, Canadian value, but with a recognition of the values of the people we're working with, securing that it's answering the need of the country and building the relationship of science and the global endeavor, and at the end of the day, securing that, you know, we don't come there with, we have a solution for you. We go there with, what are your needs? How can we help you? Thank you. Well done. Um, last question. All right, thanks. Um, the last question prompted um, my question to ask. Um, in the uh, forward-looking plan of IDRC, do you see expanding your international research to more of a global setting in Canada's north? Um, we talk about issues like food security, um, climate change, and those are issues that are impacting Canadians um, he like here in Canada. Um, so I was wondering if there's any plans to uh, look at uh, projects like that. Our mandate, uh, may I, or do you want to answer? No, 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 uh, go for it. Well, in, he's, what he's going to say is that is our mandate is, is the developing world and regions and, and communities in the developing world, um, and that those, that's where our, our, our resources have to go. But the issues cross boundaries, uh, both literally and, and also intellectually in science. And so that's what Jean's gonna, Jean, well, now I'm just, I'm just, just, he'll now talk to that a little bit more. There's, go for it. No, no, but you know, our mandate is quite clear. You know, our mandate that give, government gave us, you know, the Canadian government gave us 50 years ago is still true today. Help to develop the research capacity in the developing region of the world in order for these population and these researchers to find solutions through their own means, through the research process. At numbers of time in our history, there's been this interaction between Canada and the development world. And when we are supporting Canadian, it's always to make a difference where our mandate is. But that said, there's a number of instances where we have seen that what has taken place in the countries or in the region where we have been active has been captured and picked up in Canada. And therefore, you know, it's not a direct relationship, but I can tell you, I know numbers of Canadian researchers that have translated what they have learned in project down in Africa, I said down in Africa, or in Africa, or in Asia, or wherever, and that brought this innovation to Canada. You know, I'm thinking in particular these days about artificial intelligence and how, you know, we have a global community of research and artificial intelligence in Africa and Asia and Latin America. These people are influencing the thinking of Canadian, which is a center of excellence in the world. So that's how we are influencing the Canadian. Super. Well, and I, I would just add that the Sustainable Development Goals apply, you know, to, to, to the world and um, they provide a vehicle through which uh, researchers and policymakers can have these kinds of dialogues and there can be that kind of knowledge transfer across what's happening here and there and, and create these global global uh, knowledge networks, if you will. And so it's not that they didn't exist before, but I think the SDGs sort of uh, help us get there and also create some of those pathways across boundaries and disciplinary boundaries, et cetera. So I think that brings us to the end of, yes? Just one thing that, uh, 
Go not to it. add and drag anymore. It's not often we have the opportunity as being a global organization to have our regional director where we are present in the field with teams that are also the IDRC team. So if they could stand up, I've introduced Julie Crowley, that is our director in Senegal for West and Central Africa, uh, Barbara, who is our director for Middle East and North Africa in our Amman office, Fernando Perini, who is based in Montevideo for Latin America and the Caribbean and an Indio Chatterjee that is responsible of the all of Asia programming. And next to me is uh, Catherine Toure that already was introduced that leads our operation in East and Southern Africa and has been our champion for Sub-Saharan Africa up to very recently. So I just wanted to introduce them to you because we don't see them enough in Ottawa for all kind of good reason because their work is in the field but they make a world of difference with all our staff over here and our leadership base in Canada. So thank you very much for being here. And Catherine, I agree. Catherine? And on behalf of the regional directors, if they, if they allow me. We're working abroad all the time for Canada. We're very motivated for our work. We're also very motivated when we come here, for example, for this annual public meeting, and we have to uh, talk to members of the Canadian public about uh, how Canadian taxpayer dollars are being uh, invested around the world. So we really appreciate this opportunity to exchange. Thank you very much. So that's, I think, the end of the uh, the formal part of the program. So thank you very much. Je vous remercie. I'd like to, to thank you all for being here present. To, to stay and linger, our regional directors are here, uh, members of the leadership team are here, governors are here, so please mingle. Um, we really appreciate, as Catherine said, you coming out, um, being part of this uh, public meeting, and I uh, hope you will uh, follow. Jean keeps pushing you towards the website, but there is a lot of information there, and there will be more coming. And just to say that next year will be the year in which we're celebrating IDRC's 50th anniversary, uh, created by an act of parliament, all party support, for a very unique institution that was quite, its creation was very prescient in terms of its focus and its mandate to really um, to learn and listen to uh, people in developing countries themselves and communities themselves and then to help them develop research and science and solutions and knowledge that can help them advance. So thank you very much for being here and thank you Jean for being here, Catherine, very much. Okay, now the fun begins.